This is propellant from a NASA rocket. And here's mine. It looks a bit different, but it works the same way. When ignited, this propellant turns into a gas that pressurizes the motor casing and that pressure is converted into thrust. Today, we're casting propellant, the part that actually makes the rocket lift off the pad. This is a smaller section in a bigger build series I'm making about my largest rocket motor yet, Mega X. Mega X is aiming for around 500 pounds of thrust and a total impulse of 5,000 newton seconds. This motor is large, just over two feet long, three and a half inches in diameter, and roughly 17 pounds fully loaded. I'm planning on doing its first static fire later this fall, and I got a lot to do, so let's get started. This motor will be using a sugar-based rocket propellant, more specifically KNSB, which stands for potassium nitrate and sorbitol. In this propellant, potassium nitrate is the oxidizer and sorbitol is the fuel. There are many different types of propellant, but KNSB is cheap, easy to work with, and relatively safe. For best performance, milled potassium nitrate is preferred. Milled potassium nitrate burns and mixes more uniformly than granular. Also, open motor's performance curves and characteristics are based on a fully milled potassium nitrate formula. Milled versus granular simply describes the particle size, milled being powdery and granular being coarser crystals. The downside of milled potassium nitrate is that the finer particles makes the mixture thicker to pour, which increases trapped air bubbles when casting. Air bubbles are bad. You lose propellant mass and it can create dangerous pressure spikes. To find the right balance of milled and granular potassium nitrate, I ran a series of small tests with different ratios. For each batch, I poured two test grains, one that was tamped and one that wasn't. The untamped versions give a realistic worst case comparison even though my final casts will be tamped. Once I crack these propellant grains open, now I'm just trying to look for any crazy voids. Small air bubbles are fine, I'm gonna get that no matter what. But looking at the 60-40 no tap first, we can see there's some small air bubbles, pretty big one up here. But overall it looks pretty nice. Um, obviously cracking it doesn't get a perfect crack face, but we're just looking for bubbles, so this doesn't really matter. Looking at the tapped version, smaller air bubbles, smaller air bubbles and less. I think on this face, honestly, that's like the only one I see. Other than that, it looks pretty good. Now looking at the 70-30 no tap, very small air bubble here. Honestly, that's probably the only air bubble on this face. Now looking at the tap, can see some very small air bubbles off the bat. A decent amount of small air bubbles, decent bit of air bubbles in the 70-30 mix. The 60-40 mix, even the no-tap looks better overall, so I will use this information I have to pick a propellant for Mega X. I also ran a full 100% milled potassium nitrate test. As I expected, it came out the worst and had the most air bubbles. Based on the results, I settled for a 40% milled, 60% granular potassium nitrate for the production batches. That mix gave the best compromise with low air bubble content and good pourability. Just like I mentioned earlier, more granular potassium nitrate can reduce performance, so I add red iron oxide as a burn catalyst. The red iron oxide helps enhance combustion characteristics and compensates for using some granular potassium nitrate. After these tests, this is the formula I came up with. Also, it was fun burning all this extra propellant. Now that the propellant formula is finalized, it's time to move on to designing the casting hardware. The propellant casting hardware simply keeps the propellant inside of the liner when casting. It consists of a bottom plate, a finisil mold, a coring rod made from one inch PVC, and a top plate. For my SN motors, I used silicone tubing so the propellant wouldn't stick, but I couldn't find any tubing that would fit the size of this motor. PVC wasn't my first option, and you'll see why later when I demold this propellant. Moving down, the PVC coring rod connects directly to the finisil section, and the bottom plate has an indent to center the finisil and has walls to hold the liner in place. The top plate centers the PVC coring rod and completes the mold stack. I also made two different top plates to experiment with which one works better. Before assembly, I need to sand down the cardboard liner. I couldn't find a liner that perfectly fits the casing, so I need to sand down the outside until it slips in. I do the sanding outside because the dust is a mess and the fine particles are not good to breathe. I start with 80 grit sandpaper, and once it fits, I finish the outside with 240 grit. Once the liner is sanded down, everything fits perfectly. 
Before casting, I apply heavy lubrication on the casting hardware. One of the worst case scenarios I could think of happening is not being able to take off the casting hardware once the propellant is poured. I first spray a non-stick dry film lubricant and then add a layer of petroleum jelly for extra protection. Then the last step is to hot glue the bottom plate to the liner so when I tamp the propellant later, it doesn't come off. With the hardware assembled and lubricated, we're ready to move on to casting the propellant. Before we get into casting this repellent, a quick thanks to JLC3DP for supporting this video. They supplied the high quality 3D printed parts you see in this build. I've used JLC3DP on multiple projects now and they've been solid on both part quality and turnaround time. Whether it's a one-off prototype or a batch run, their prints hold up and the tolerance is excellent. Their site makes ordering painless. Upload your design, get an instant quote, and place your orders in minutes. One thing I really like is that they actually check the parts so they arrive ready to be used. I've had prints from other places where cleanup and sanding was needed, but JLC 3DP's parts came out of the box ready for this project. Plus, their customer support has been quick to respond whenever I had questions on materials or finishes. If you prototype, machine, or build in the garage, their service saves you time and keeps costs reasonable. I'm honestly impressed with the finish and fit of these parts for Mega X's casting hardware. If you want to check them out, head to the link on the top of the description to head to JLC3DP. Thanks again for making this video possible. Before I cast propellant, I make sure my area is clean and ready. Making a checklist is very important when you're managing both the casting process and filming. Also, quick tip, I label all my measuring beakers and spoons. As you'll see in a minute, I pour my grains in multiple sections, and this will prevent chemical cross-contamination. Also, with complex pours like these, it's smart to have a friend help out. Extra hands are always useful for handling equipment, holding lights, or passing tools. Once all the prep is complete, it's time to measure out all the propellant chemicals. Real quick before we start, this is not a complete tutorial on how to cast propellant. Please do your own research because this video does not contain everything you need to know for casting propellant safely. All right, everything's set up. We got a tripod there. Got the FX30 up there. We got all the propellant chemicals out here labels, checklist, we got the propellant data sheet right here. Then when we turn around here, we have the propellant liner. It has a cap on it right now. We'll change it out to, I'm probably gonna try the funnel first and then possibly that one. But yeah, here's how we're looking. We got some lights. We got another camera that's gonna go right here. We also do have a camera all the way up there, which will give a good overview shot of casting the propellant. The very first step is measuring out each of the ingredients. I start off by measuring out the sorbitol. Then I add the red iron oxide. After the red iron oxide, it's time to measure out the two different types of potassium nitrate. Potassium nitrate tends to clump up when exposed to moisture. So before mixing, I add the potassium nitrate to a Ziploc bag to mash it up and break up any large clumps. As you'll see, there will still be some small clumps, but I'll work those out with a spatula when heating the propellant. Now that all the chemicals are measured out, I add them to a pan on a hot plate. I'm personally using a wok. It works out very well. The wok's edges sit directly over the cooktop, so if any propellant spills, it won't fall directly onto the heating element. I mix the propellant for around 5 minutes without the heat on to make sure that everything is thoroughly combined and any clumps are eliminated. Once the mixing is done, I turn on the cooktop. It's important to keep stirring and avoid letting the mixture sit in one spot, which can cause uneven heating. When the propellant reaches 250 degrees Fahrenheit, it's time to take it off the cooktop and pour it into the liner. This propellant cools really quickly, so I'm testing using a heating pad around the section where the propellant will go. The goal is to warm the liner so the propellant does not cool and stick immediately. I'm using a funnel top plate to make pouring into the liner easier. After the first pour, I learned it did not work out too great. The propellant cooled as it touched the plastic and clogged the holes. Also, you can see that we're rotating the liner. This is so the propellant is poured evenly around each fin of the finisil. After the first pour was complete, I tamped the propellant a lot. I also use a dowel to push down any of the propellant that has stuck to the sides of the liner. This ensures the propellant settles to the bottom and eliminates voids. Also to help the propellant settle to the bottom, I used a heat gun to hopefully reheat some of the propellant that stuck to the sides of the liner. Now that the first pour is done, I let the section cool and come back in a few hours to do the second pour. The second pour went much more smoothly. On the third pour, I switched to using a respirator. The milled potassium nitrate was getting into the air and it is not good to breathe. Then it was the same process, repeating over and over. After about the sixth pour, I noticed that the PVC core actually heated up and became very malleable when the propellant around it was hot. This was not ideal, but it didn't ruin the coring rod. After four long days, the propellant grain is finally complete. 
It didn't take one, not two, not three, not four, not five, not six, not seven, not eight, but nine total pours. Building a grain this size is a lot of work. In total, I put around 14 hours into casting this one grain. Now for the most stressful part, removing the casting hardware from the grain. At this point, I didn't know if it would come off or reveal a bunch of air bubbles or even if this grain would be usable. My plan was to first remove the bottom plate, then the PVC corn rod, and then the finisle section. The bottom plate came off pretty straightforward. I cut around the hot glue and then pulled it away. Once the bottom plate was removed, I put the propellant on top of a vise so when I hit the corn rod, the finisle section would have somewhere to come out. This didn't work. I whacked it a bunch of times with a hammer, but the corn rod was really stuck onto the propellant. To make it easier, I set the propellant on wooden blocks and hit the corn rod with a sledgehammer. This dislodged the corn rod from the propellant, but it was still impossible to pull out the PVC pipe. Instead of removing the corn rod first, I used a dowel through the PVC pipe to remove the finisil mold. Once that was out, I used a smaller diameter PVC pipe to tap the corn rod out. This demold process is definitely something that I'll need to improve in the future, so stay tuned. With the grain finally out of the mold, I can move on and take a closer look on how it actually turned out. Overall, for my first time doing a pour this large, it actually came out pretty good. No major voids except for one near the finisil. It's a little tough to see, but with my foam flashlight, it's easier. We'll address that void in a minute. I can also use the propellant mass from open motor to cross check with the casting. After weighing the propellant and subtracting the liner mass, the propellant comes out to 3,788 grams. We're a little off, but within 97% of the total mass, so it should work. One of the perks of this propellant is that you can heat it again and do some patchwork. I'm going to try to patch the larger void near the finisil. This is a tricky process. Getting small amounts of hot propellant to bond with the existing grain is difficult. It's also a very small area to work in. I fix the void next to the finisil, then add some to the finisil face that broke out when removing the mold. And finally, I repair the top section. These fixes added about 30 grams of propellant. To store this propellant, I keep it in a vacuum sealed bag wrapped in paper towels and with silica gel packets to control moisture. And here's how the propellant looks fully finished. Honestly, I'm really happy on how it turned out, especially since it's my first time casting a grain this large. After patching up the voids, we're within 98% of the targeted mass. What I didn't notice until just now were some small hairline cracks in the aft end of the propellant. They seem to be mostly localized to this area, but there could be more. Cracks like these can cause the chamber pressure to spike higher than expected. So I want your input. Should I add a few more radial bolts to the nozzle and bulkhead to account for this spike, or recast the whole grain and push back the static fire by a couple weeks? Honestly, I'm kind of leaning towards just testing it. The motor will be inside the blast chamber I just built, so there's no safety concerns. And honestly, I really don't want to delay this static fire. The next video will be all about building the test stand for this rocket motor. It's going to be a cool one, so make sure you subscribe and put post notifications on so you're the first to check it out. As always, if you have any tips or questions, drop them in the comments below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.